selfless and caring mother of three. She always thought about other people. She was just a bright light shining. Viciously murdered in her own home. Her bedroom was incredibly blood soaked, unlike I'd ever seen before. There was anger involved in this crime. I remember just screaming. Investigators are sent down a rabbit hole of suspects. She didn't like him. She didn't trust him. It raised a red flag that there might be some sort of affair going on. She was jealous of her life, of what she had. There was clearly bad blood between them. Every lead appears to turn into a dead end. It just stalled. That was disheartening until a surprising witness comes forward. It was unbelievable. It was the break we were looking for. Exposing a killer no one saw coming. I was pretty shocked. I just remember being sick to my stomach. Portland Township lies in the heart of Michigan. It's fairly rural, nice, pleasant, kind of a good hometown feel. It's one of those areas that everybody gets along and you, when you're driving by their house, they're waving at you and it's just peaceful and quiet. This quaint community is stunned on Saturday, August 5th, 2006, when the Kent County Sheriff's Office receives a 911 call. Emergency. My daughter, we just found her in bed and she's got a lash on her arm and uh, she's all bloody. Just before 5 o'clock, we received a, a call of a potential suicide at the Pagel residence. Officers are immediately dispatched to the home of 41 year old Renee Pagel. We were met by Renee's stepmother and her father. They were both just in shock. Renee's father indicated that his daughter was in her bedroom. When I first walked into the bedroom, I observed Renee laying on the bed. I could just remember seeing all the blood, the blood soaked sheets, her shirt, there's blood on her face. It was obvious that Renee Pagel was deceased and it wasn't a suicide. This was a homicide. Officers secure the scene as homicide detectives arrive to investigate. Her bedroom was incredibly blood soaked, unlike I'd ever seen before. The bed was covered with blood. There was blood spatter on the walls, on the ceiling. She was stabbed multiple times. I was pretty shocked by the amount of wounds that she had. When I looked at her hand, I saw a large laceration almost in the middle of her hand to be, in my opinion, a defensive wound. Renee was in the fight for her life. Unfortunately, she had lost. For detectives, the viciousness of the attack is a clue itself. It appears to us it's a crime of passion. If somebody uh, has something against this victim so much so that they want to brutalize this person as much as they possibly could. This was personal. Somebody went into that residence to murder Renee. Who in Renee's life would want to attack her and could be capable of such violence? Born in 1965, Renee's spirit was always full of joy. Renee was the most generous person I have ever known. She loved life. She was always smiling. Renee Pagel devoted her life to helping others. She was a nurse practitioner. She had done medical mission trips around the world. And then she also worked at a homeless clinic here in town. She always thought about other people. Renee's greatest joy was being a mother of three. She loved her kids so much. She was a great mom. Recently separated from Michael, her husband of 10 years, Renee shared custody of her children while always remaining a devoted mother. The last couple years, because she wanted to be home with her kids, 
and wanted to have some more normal hours, she chose to teach at a technical center. Even as a teacher, Renee found new ways to help people. One of her students had come into class one day and was really down, and, and Renee said, what's the matter? And she said, well, my dad is, is dying. He needs a kidney. And so Renee agreed to give her kidney to this man who she had never met. She was just so selfless, and it manifested itself in so many ways. Renee had undergone the kidney transplant surgery just five days before her stunning death. So she was already in a weakened state when she was attacked. Could the killer have timed the attack, knowing that Renee would be recuperating? Detectives look closer at her injuries, hoping they'll reveal telling details about the murder weapon. It seemed to be a very strong and well-made knife and large. Just the amount of uh, damage it did to the victim's body, it was at least an inch, inch and a half blade that was wide. There's no sign of the knife, but forensic technicians search the bedroom for other evidence. There was large amounts of blood that our scientific support unit had to collect, and they collected trace evidence like hairs and fibers for testing. Detectives continue to search the rest of the home. What struck me about this case that was kind of odd, there was no other areas in the house that were disturbed, that were bloody or anything tracked to the home. It seemed to be very honed in on just her bedroom. It really kind of puzzled us as investigators. It was the most bizarre scene I've ever been on. This person, in my opinion, had to know that they had to cover their tracks, and I think it was planned, and they thought this out ahead of time. As forensics continue their work, detectives speak with Renee's parents. Her father, obviously, he was extremely upset. What he had just found out, his daughter brutally murdered. Detectives ask her father to help them put together a picture of Renee's last known movements. He last saw her the night before, around 4 or 5 in the evening, when he was picking up the children and bringing them to their father's house, who lived approximately 15 to 20 minutes away from Renee. With Renee's children safe with their father at the time of the murder, she was home alone. He told us he spoke with her on the phone around 8 or 9 in the evening, just checked in on her because obviously he had a lot of concern of her health. Based on the state of the body, detectives believe Renee was murdered sometime between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. They ask her parents who Renee might have seen last. Her father talked to me about a tenant, Mike Decker, who was a acquaintance of Renee that has been living on the property for uh, approximately a year and a half, two years. Also, he did speak about a contentious divorce with her husband, Michael that she was going through. Mike wanted full custody. Mike wanted the home. Mike wanted to not work and have Renee work and be at the provider. So that obviously piqued my interest. Could either of these men have possibly wanted Renee dead? Detectives know they have to hit the ground running right away. We have to find out who all these people are and go and start to question them to try to find out where they were on the night of the murder. Coming up, investigators uncover an ominous obsession. There was a lot of writings about his hatred for Renee. Alarming secrets. The ceiling had a hidden compartment. Renee told me how betrayed she felt. She was extremely upset. She was very hurt by this. And the truth blindsides everyone. We've never had a, a break like this. It was, you're not going to believe this. Just disbelief. I'm still reeling from that one.
Detectives in a small Michigan town are investigating the vicious murder of 41-year-old mother of three, Renee Pagel. Police are looking into two possible suspects, her tenant and her estranged husband. They first turn their attention to Renee's ex, Michael Pagel. In the beginning, they seem like your average all-American couple. She did tell me that she did love him. She wanted marriage in a family, and he was the opportunity. She looked at him, I think the words were, the knight in shining armor. And speaking to friends of the family, they described Michael as a fantastic dad, that he was always about his children. Nobody said anything bad about him. Married life seemed like a dream come true until cracks started to appear. When I interviewed numerous people, I was told that Mike didn't want a full-time job. Mike wanted to be at home with the kids and let Renee do everything and support him. They were just having a lot of issues back and forth with one another. In early 2005, Mike abruptly surprised Renee with divorce papers. She was very shocked and just sickened to the core. There had been some turmoil in the past between them, but in her mind, things were actually getting better. They were kind of turning around, so she was blindsided by it. She said to me, he expected, I mean expected, the house, the kids, and $2,000 a month. In June 2006, just seven weeks before she was murdered, Renee and Michael had their day in divorce court. When the judge ruled in her favor and said that she got the kids, she got the house, and he was going to have to get a better paying job, something flipped in him. Was Michael so angered by the ruling that he killed Renee in a furious rage? There were a lot of things that put him at the top of our list as a potential suspect that had killed Renee. Detectives go to question Michael. When we arrived at Mike's house, he was not there. His mother said that he should be back shortly. And I said, just want to get an idea of what were you guys doing last night? And she said, well, Mike had the kids. They were having a fortnight in the living room where Mike had set up some pillows and some blankets. Then she stated about eight in the morning, she and Michael had a brief conversation and then they went about their day. So basically she was giving him an alibi that he was home all night with the kids. As police finish the interview with his mother, Michael arrives. I explained to him that something had happened to Renee and we would like to speak to you about this. When Michael was told that she had passed away, there was no reaction out of him. And immediately, without me even going any further, Michael reached into his wallet and gave me an attorney card and said, yeah, I've been told not to talk to the police. Here's my attorney. So I thought that was extremely odd that Michael didn't want to dig further into what happened to uh, Renee. After consulting with his divorce attorney, he told investigators he wouldn't answer any questions. Michael's reticence to cooperate is a red flag. And on August 6th, the day after Renee's murder, police arrive at his home with a search warrant. We are looking for any type of knife that may have been used during the murder. We took a lot of knives from the house, but we found no knives that matched the length and the size and, and the different characteristics of the knife that was used. Police also collect hair samples and fingerprints from Michael. We wanted to get photos of his body to make sure that there was no cuts or anything on him. We wanted to look at clothing to see if there was any blood, trace evidence anywhere. All the forensic evidence that we collected, we never found anything that was useful in our investigation. All the knives in his home were examined and there was nothing to link them to this crime. We had no murder weapon. We had no real evidence. There was nothing. It was clean. So when we left that search warrant, I would say we really came out empty-handed. We didn't have anything to tie this murder to Mike Pagel. Despite his potential motive, 
Michael Pagel drops off detectives' list of suspects, while news of Renee's violent death quickly spreads across town. Her friend called me and said, Chris, Renee's dead. It was surreal. I remember curling up in a fetal position and just screaming. I screamed. I was angry. As her friends and loved ones struggle with her death, Renee's autopsy report comes in. The cause of death was blunt force trauma, homicide. It was a large, heavy-duty knife that was used on her. The autopsy revealed upwards of 50 stab wounds. There were numerous lacerations to the hands and the feet, suggesting defensive wounds. She was stabbed over 50 times. I'm still reeling from that one. It was so brutal. Detectives continue their investigation and now focus their attention on Renee's tenant, Mike Decker. She had this barn that had an upstairs apartment, and he was a renter. The barn was about 75 yards away from the main home. He could have been involved. He could have been a witness. He could have overheard something. One of her friends believed that the week of uh, her surgery, Renee was going to have pizza with Mike Decker and that she felt that there was some type of maybe a relationship going on. So that sparked our interest. I mean, if he's having a relationship with Renee, did something happen to cause him to get upset and potentially do this horrific crime? We had to find him immediately. days into the investigation of Renee Pagel's murder, detectives have a possible suspect. Her tenant, Mike Decker, who's rumored to be romantically involved with Renee. Detectives interview Mike at his apartment on Renee's property. At first, I kind of thought loner, 30-year-old gentleman, unemployed, living above a barn. I thought that was kind of odd. When we were speaking to Mr. Decker, we asked him if he's having a relationship with Renee, romantic or whatnot. Mike said that the relationship is more of a friendship or a kindness thing, no romantic involvement. He denied having any dinner with Renee over the past week. He stated that it was actually a month or two before he suggested that they go out for pizza just as friends, but Renee had turned that down because she was busy. Police ask Mike Decker where he was on the night of the murder. He stated that he went into a local city to eat by himself, drove back probably between eight or nine. When he arrived at home, he watches a little bit of TV and then goes to bed between one and two in the morning. Detectives ask him if he heard anything that night, especially after what they had found at the crime scene. We did locate a tire track and a footwear impression in Renee's driveway. He denied hearing anything from Renee's house. Mike tells police he didn't notice anything unusual the next morning either. He woke up in the morning around 9 or 10 and then went to meet with his family to go see a bike race. Part of the problem with Mike Decker's alibi, even though he was cooperative through this process, he was on the property when this murder happened. With no one to corroborate his alibi, police get a warrant to search Mike's apartment. We seized his pipe from his sink because we wanted to see if there was any blood or trace evidence in there, and then we found a couple of large knives. The evidence is rushed to the crime lab for analysis. The knives and the pipe forensically did not show anything. There were no signs of blood. We found no knives that matched the type of knife that was used. But still, Mike could not be ruled out. A week after the homicide, detectives interview him again, this time at the sheriff's office. 
He showed no issues of concern of us looking at him as a potential suspect from gathering any type of physical evidence from him. We even offered him a polygraph. And Mr. Decker submitted to that also and, and passed without any uh, deceit. With nothing tying Mike Decker to the crime, investigators let him go. Searching for any further clues about Renee, detectives reach out to her parents once again, and in turn, get a lead on a new suspect, Renee's own sister, Michelle. Renee's father stated that the relationship between Renee and Michelle was strained. He mentioned that Michelle was jealous of Renee's life, of what she had. She wanted a successful career, a family, a home, all of those things. Renee and Michelle's problems went beyond sibling rivalry. During the divorce, Renee's attorney was able to subpoena the phone records of Michael Pagel. So he turned those over to Renee. When she examined phone records, she learned that Mike and Michelle were talking frequently. So she was extremely upset. She was very hurt by this. There was such significant communication between Mike Pagel and the sister Michelle that it raised a red flag to us right away that there might be some sort of affair going on. Renee told me how betrayed she felt by her sister. She really struggled with that. During the interviews with numerous people, it was mentioned that Michelle potentially was having a relationship with Michael. Once I learned that, it's obviously somebody we wanted to look at. Michelle is brought in for an interview. And though she says that she is saddened by her sister's death, her answers raise eyebrows with investigators. She didn't speak very highly of Renee. She was not happy at all the way that uh, Renee was handling the divorce. Michelle clearly took Mike's side in it and kind of put her sister in the bad light. She felt that Mike was a good father, and it was her sister that was really trying to take advantage of him. We did ask her if she was in a relationship or had a relationship with Michael, and she completely denied it. Detectives ask Michelle where she was the night of the murder. She said she was working into the evening, and that evening she was home with her roommate. Basically, she was stating that she was home the evening of the murder. Michelle did take a polygraph and she was found to be truthful and did not appear to have any involvement in the homicide. With Michelle all but ruled out, investigators discovered that she isn't the only family member Renee had issues with. When I spoke with Renee's parents, it was mentioned that Michael, her soon-to-be ex-husband, had a brother. The brother was Charles Pago. They called him Bo. And they said that he was very strange, very odd. He and Renee did not get along. Renee didn't like him. She didn't trust him. When detectives dig deeper, they uncover something troubling. We learned from a close friend of Renee that he had been married numerous times, and she believed that maybe Bo had murdered his last wife. Was Bo a killer? And had he now killed again? That obviously raised some red flags for us as investigators, and that's somebody we wanted to speak with very quickly. Detectives investigating the vicious stabbing of Renee Pagel are looking at her estranged husband's brother, Bo Pagel. Bo was married three times in the past, and one of his ex-wives died under suspicious circumstances. One of Renee's friends gives a statement to police, claiming that she believed Bo may have killed his ex-wife. Obviously, what really sent us his way was the potential murder of his last wife, so that had our attention. Detectives must determine if Bo could actually be a killer. They look deeper into his background. Bo was a loner, lived at home with his mom. We learned that he was a on the road trucker and he traveled all over the country. He would be gone days at a time. Investigators also look closer at Bo and Renee's fractured relationship. There was clearly 
bad blood between him and Renee, dating back years, going back to the wedding. We found out that Bo refused to be in the wedding. He was going to be the best man. He did not like her, thought she was not good for Mike, and he didn't approve of it whatsoever. He was outspoken to Michael about even marrying Renee. And I think the relationship between Bo and Mike was really more of an estranged relationship for the 10 years that Mike and Renee were married. But after Renee and Michael's separation, everything changed. I do know that once Mike filed for divorce, he and Bo rekindled that relationship and became pretty close. Bo was, I believe, happy that Renee was now out of the picture and he could have his brother back. Could Bo have wanted Renee permanently out of Michael's life? Detectives bring him in for questioning. So he interviewed Bo and he denied any knowledge of the murder, denied any involvement. Bo had said that through the week he was on the road trucking. He got home Thursday night. Bo's alibi was that he was essentially across the state. He had driven a route the day of the homicide. He had gotten back around 6 o'clock and had gone out with some friends for dinner. And then afterwards, he stated he went home, spoke to his daughter, and then went to bed. And then the next morning got up and went canoeing with his daughter. We contacted his work. We spoke to the family that he actually uh, had dinner with uh, that Friday evening to account for uh, they were with him, what restaurant, until what time. It pretty much matched up. Though most of his story checks out, no one can confirm that Bo was at home at the time of Renee's murder. Needing more information, detectives reach out to Bo's daughter. We confirmed with her that they went on the canoe trip in the morning. Bo's daughter also puts to rest any suspicion that Bo was responsible for her mother's death. She gave us details about her mother that we didn't know. She was a diabetic, she had some blood sugar problems, and she really didn't care for going to the doctor. So she didn't seek the medical help that she needed, and that ultimately is what resulted in her death. She did not suspect Bo of doing anything. Though Bo's alibi isn't ironclad, there is nothing concrete to link him to Renee's murder, and he is released. It's been six weeks since the homicide, and the investigation has ground to a halt. The reason that we were stuck is because there was no physical evidence that would help tie any one person to this crime. We looked at every person, the strange husband, his brother, Bo, Renee's sister, and Renee's tenant. And there was nothing to link them to this crime. Police continue investigating for many months. But with no fresh leads, the case goes cold. It just stalled. There was a point where I felt that we would never have a conclusion in this case. It was just sad that, that we couldn't bring closure to Renee into her family. As the months went by, I was just like, what is going on? Once the months turns into years, that was uh, disheartening. For 13 years, there are no new developments in the case. But through it all, Renee's best friend never gives up hope. We created a website in the year 2007, and it was a really therapeutic way for people to come and grieve and share stories. And that website was very effective in getting the word out about Renee's murder, doing whatever it took to find justice for Renee. In a stunning turn of events, on November 18th, 2019, Chris Crandall receives a surprising message on social media. Mike's brother, Bo, sent me a friend request. And of course, I was very startled. And it was just after that that I got a message from Bo. All of a sudden, after all these years, Bo wanted to talk. Thirteen 
15 years after Renee Pagel is viciously stabbed to death. Her best friend receives a message from Renee's brother-in-law, Bo Pagel, wanting to talk. And of course, I called the police and let them know that Bo had contacted me. So we arranged to have the conversation between Chris and Bo recorded. As a former suspect in Renee's murder, was Bo about to confess? He called me clearly wanting to let it be known that Mike was losing it. Bo was afraid that he would be Mike's next victim. And I said to Bo, who do you think Mike's first victim was? And he danced around that and wouldn't answer it. And Bo said, I believe Mike will kill me. And it was then that I was entertaining the idea that Mike was not so innocent. I listened to that conversation and was very concerned. Bo believes Mike's capable of killing somebody. We felt this was a big break. We now knew that Bo may have information about whether or not Mike did commit the murder. On February 3rd, 2020, two months after his conversation with Chris Crandall, police formally interview Bo. I just asked him to tell us what he knew about anybody being involved in Renee's murder. And he quickly told us that Mike Pagel was responsible for Renee's murder. It's a stunning revelation. It was the break we were looking for. It was the big piece of information that we needed. Knowing this is their chance to finally solve Renee's murder, police get an official statement from Bo. Bo laid out the story for us. Back in 2011, Bo and Mike decided to go out. Mike grabbed his six-pack of beer, and they just drove around and talked as brothers. And they stopped over the top of one bridge over a small river, and in the midst of that conversation, Mike produced a bag, and inside the bag was a knife that was wrapped in a cloth, and Mike made the comment to Bo of, this is how I finalized my divorce, which was a complete shock to Bo, and it immediately made Bo angry. He said, I believed you for all these years, we've supported you, and come to find out, you're the one responsible. I can't believe you would have done that, and I think this, this made Mike angry. He expected Bo to congratulate him. So the way Bo described it was out of frustration. Mike took the knife and threw it into the river. Bo described it as a about a 12 inch long, bigger knife. And it appeared to be a very strong, sturdy knife. Investigators get Bo to show them exactly where Michael had thrown the knife. There was quite a bit of old metal, various pieces of cars and other things inside the river. And in my opinion, that wasn't a safe diving environment. We had to find another means to search the bottom of the river. Police wonder if they will be able to recover a knife that has been in the water for nine years. Then one of the detectives comes up with an idea. It's called a rare earth magnet. The magnet is something that I've had at home, and it just came to mind as an option for a way to search the watery area and to grab whatever metal pieces were on the bottom of the river. It was tremendously impressive for him to come up with his own homemade magnet device, and you know he concocted his own fishing line and pulling it through the stream, which is remarkable. Police spent three days painstakingly dragging the riverbed with no success. So we were on our last few passes of the river and I began pulling toward my side and then it was, you're not gonna believe this, just disbelief. The knife was stuck to the magnet and it was exactly as Bo described. It was late in the day, I wanna say three or four o'clock and I got the phone call, he got the knife. I'm like, no, are you kidding me? He got the, no. 
And this is the magnet and the knife exactly as we found it. It was awesome. It was everything you could hope for when you're investigating a case to get that piece of evidence that you know you need, that you really weren't sure if it was going to be there, but there it is. Police now need to confirm if the knife found matches the knife used in Renee Pagel's murder. We brought it down to the medical examiner's office. They viewed it and instantly said, absolutely. It's consistent with the injuries that are on Renee's body. We were very confident we had the murder weapon. Unbelievable. We've never had a, a break like this. We got the needle in the haystack by finding the knife, and now we had a murder weapon that backed up what a witness said. It allowed us to validate Bo's statement that that knife was thrown in that water by Mike Pagel. On February 6, 2020, 13 years after Renee's death, Michael Pagel is officially charged with her murder. So this case is going to hinge a lot on the testimony of Bo, but it's still circumstantial evidence. And is the jury going to believe him or not? In the midst of that, the defense attorneys asked if we would consider a plea offer. When someone asks for a plea, it usually means that they're willing to tell the truth. And in this case, that was one of the conditions, is we wanted to hear the truth as part of the plea agreement. The prosecution agrees to a plea deal of second-degree murder and a minimum of 25 years in prison. We wanted to get a term of years to make sure he was old enough that he would never harm anyone again. On May 20th, 2020, 55-year-old Michael Pagel agrees to plead guilty to second-degree murder, avoiding a trial by jury. But at his plea hearing, Michael suddenly turns the case on its head. It was unbelievable. And I just remember being sick to my stomach. After 13 years of investigating the heinous murder of Renee Pagel, her estranged husband is finally being charged for the brutal crime. But at his plea hearing, Michael makes an admission that takes everyone by surprise. I hired my brother, Charles Pagel, to kill Renee Pagel. Charles Pagel murdered Renee Pagel. We were all absolutely shocked when he said that his brother did this. Mike maintained the fact that Bo was the one responsible. He admitted that he had orchestrated it and that he had planned it, but insisted that Bo was the one that actually did the stabbing, which was a complete shock to us. We had investigated and we found no evidence, nothing to directly tie Bo Pagel to this murder. Had Bo been hiding his involvement all along? While detectives take another look at him, they also dig for more evidence against Michael. And after several searches of his home, they make a surprising discovery. At Mike's house, we found the ceiling had a hidden compartment. When we took this down, we found three hard drives in this hidden compartment. Investigators spend time decoding the contents of Michael's hard drives, and what they find is chilling. In those hard drives, there was journaling. I would call it strange. It appeared to be written by almost two different personalities, one that would talk back and forth to the other. I talked about planning to divorce, how much he hated her. There was a lot of writings about his dislike and his hatred for Renee. Then, weeks later, police tracked down a crucial witness. We uncovered a friend who had said that he had gifted a knife to Michael that was substantially similar to the one that was actually found. And he admitted that he gave it to Mike as a gift, and it was delivered directly to Mike Pagel. So that helped us put the knife in Mike's hands. 
so now you have a knife that was found in the river that now a friend is saying had given to Michael and not to Bo. While the evidence is circumstantial, police believe it strengthens their case even further against Michael. There is nothing that could back up Michael's story in terms of physical evidence, any other witnesses, anything else other than his word about it. Whereas Bo at least had stuff to back it up. His alibi backed up and the physical evidence that he provided backed it up. So there's just absolutely nothing that shows that Bo did this. This was Michael Bagel. This was all him that committed this murder that night. Investigators conclude what likely happened on the night of Renee's murder. When the children were sleeping, he snuck out of his house and he went over to Renee's. It's pretty well known that she donated a kidney. Obviously, she wasn't strong at this point. She was asleep in bed and he walked in with that knife and brutally stabbed her. I believe that Mike no doubt planned this out. There's no way you leave a crime scene that clean and it's not carefully planned. How he absolutely didn't leave a blood drop a fingerprint, a mark, any physical evidence. Mo tells us about Mike commenting that he had worn coveralls and galoshes. So he had taken precaution to not get his clothes bloody and that he had removed those items and then put them in a garbage bag and left. And that the clothes were later burned. He's not a stupid man. He knew enough to cover his tracks. He went in there purposely. He had an intent, he had a purpose, and he went in there to kill her, and he did. There was anger involved in this crime. This was evil. But why would Michael kill Renee? I believe Mike Pagel was very upset with the way the divorce was proceeding, that he didn't get sole custody of the children, that he didn't get the family home. Things just weren't going his way. He's got motive, and if anybody's got rage, it's the about-to-be ex-husband who's not getting what he wanted. I think that the writing was on the wall for him that this was the end. On October 5th, 2020, Michael Pagel is sentenced to 25 to 50 years in prison. I never thought it would take 14 years to uh, bring justice to Renee and to her family. But, you know, you always had in the back of your mind that justice would be served. It was incredible exhilaration and I do believe that the information that I provided and the passion that I poured into this did help. Renee's loved ones will always be inspired by her memory. The friendship that we had was deep. It was eternal. She brought so much beauty to this world. She was just a bright light shining. Oh, I miss her. A selfless and caring single mother. She just loved life. Dana would help in any way she could. Is ruthlessly killed in her own home. There was a great deal of damage to her throat. It was a rather brutal attack. And it would have taken somebody very, very strong to have done that kind of damage. Leaving a family devastated. I cried every night. You just can't fathom it. You can't comprehend it. Police uncover a deadly obsession. She was being stalked by this guy. He had become violent. He was a heavy drug user. To expose a killer closer than expected. How is that possible? Someone that Dana was trying to help. That had to be a huge betrayal. Every time they looked at an obvious suspect, that person had an alibi. What I was told completely changed everything. That was quite a shock. 
I couldn't believe it. It was all a bunch of lies. Puyallup, Washington, a charming and peaceful town at the foot of Mount Rainier. The city of Puyallup is about 30 miles south of Seattle, six miles east of Tacoma. It's just a nice little town. It's a community, a lot of families, parks. It has a small town feel to it. There's a lot of small businesses. The downtown area is easily walkable. It's a terrific little community. The tranquility is shattered in August 2001 when police get a call from a worried couple who cannot reach their nanny, Dana Laskowski, even after several attempts to contact her. We got a call from Dana's employers that she hadn't shown up for work. Her employers assured us it was very unusual for Dana to not show up. An officer is sent to Dana's home to investigate and arrives at 11 a.m., three full hours after she was expected to arrive for work. The officer arrived. He knocked on the front, knocked on the back door, and found the back door ajar. He walked in the back door, walked through the kitchen, and through the house, and found an adult female who's deceased on the couch in the living room. Working off a general description, the officer identifies the victim as Dana Laskowski. The crime scene is secured until detectives from Puyallup PD arrive. When we found her on the couch, we see the position of her body, and that's unusual. Her one arm is underneath her head, her other arm is behind her back. She's twisted so that her waist is at an awkward angle. The awkward twist to her body is something that we don't normally see in a natural death scene. It just has a sense that it's a murder. We saw abrasions to the neck, and there was a small pool of blood at her mouth. We did see abrasions on her elbows and knees. The investigator's suspicions are confirmed. Dana was murdered. What it looked like was a strangulation that occurred on the couch, and then the offender simply left her in the position that we found her. Forensic technicians searched the living room for evidence. Primarily the items that we collected were either hair or fibers and then extensively processed for fingerprints. When we were processing the carpet, we discovered blood trail or spatter of some sort. The locations of those were believed to be consistent with the struggle. Investigators continue their work throughout the rest of the home. It looked to me like the house had been ransacked. It had a feel that it had been searched where someone was looking for something. We discovered a basement window that had appeared to have been recently broken and it was possibly a point of entry. One of the first things we're going to wonder is, was the victim murdered by a burglar that broke into her house during the night? Or was the murderer somebody that she had invited over the house? As they wrap up their work at the scene, detectives contact Dana's family to deliver the tragic news. My son phoned me, and I said, yeah, and he says, he said, Dana's dead. That was it. I was pretty much in shock, and I said, tell me one more time, say what you said, because I, I didn't want to believe it. You can't imagine that, because, you know, there was no reason. Born in 1965, Dana's childhood was filled with joy. She was the happiest kid in the world. So she just it was so easy. She just loved life. Dana was also creative, a special bond she shared with her father, Bill, an award-winning artist. She was always making things. Well, she was artistic, like me, and was interested in what I did and, and wanted to help. So we were close. Just being around her, you felt her energy. You felt her 
enthusiasm and her zest for living each moment. As she grew older, Dana developed a nurturing spirit. She was babysitting from the time she was very young, and she loved the kids, and she always wanted to have a daycare. In 1989, Dana met Sam and fell in love. The couple married quickly, but from the start, there were complications. She was having trouble getting pregnant. In 1993, after years of fertility treatments, Dana's wish of starting a family finally came true. She was so excited when she found out she was pregnant because that's what she really wanted all her life. And it was a pretty exciting time. Dana's delight only grew when she discovered they were having triplets. She loved the kids because then she could bake and she could make things and do art. She loved it. She really did. But by 2000, after 11 years of marriage, the stress of parenting took its toll on their relationship. Dana told me that she had moved and that they were separated. As a single mom, Dana worked hard to provide a good home for her triplets. Dana cared deeply about family, and especially for her troubled 17-year-old niece, Amanda, with whom she was very close. Dana would do anything for Amanda. Amanda loved Dana, because, you know, Dana was kind of this flashy, artistic-type person, And Amanda loved all that, too. Dana was a very kind, caring person, loved her family. Amanda was a frequent runaway. So Dana wanted to guide Amanda out of risky behavior, away from drugs, away from the runaway lifestyle. Amanda had a rough relationship with her parents, so would often turn to her favorite aunt. By all accounts, she was the kind of the cool aunt that you could go and actually tell the truth to about your problems. No judgment, just help. Dana soon became a surrogate mom to Amanda and her best friend, Emily Lauenborg. Food, showers, a warm place to stay, money. Dana would open her heart and her home to help in any way she could. She was a mentor and also a friend. Dana had an open-door policy and would always welcome Amanda's friends to her home. She was very comfortable at her age being amongst teenagers as though they were her peers. Just everybody loved her. But now, all that is left is loss and unanswered questions. For us to lose Dana was so hard. Losing a child is probably the worst thing that can ever happen. And, uh, you know, she shouldn't have died before me. Who would want this loving and generous spirit dead? And why? This murder was very unusual. Right from the start, we had a lot of things that needed to be done in order to find the killer. Back at the station, detectives start reaching out to those closest to Dana. They begin with her ex-husband, Sam, who they learn has the triplet staying with him. As the ex-husband, Sam, is a person of interest and the first person we needed to look at. But we couldn't find him. The fact that he was missing, this is significant to us. We have to find him. Coming up, investigators uncover a dark obsession. He had kind of gotten fixated on her and he didn't really take no for an answer. And alarming secrets. In the journal, it said, 10 things I want to do before I die, and one of those 10 things was kill somebody and get away with it. That point to a killer no one would ever suspect. I felt what he was telling me was not possible. You just can't comprehend that it's real. And the truth is finally revealed. That's about as close to a confession as you're gonna get. Police investigating the murder of mother of three, Dana Laskowski, are trying to track down her estranged husband, Sam, when suddenly they receive a surprise call. Sam actually reached out to the police to try to find out what had happened. Sam, it turned out, he had taken his kids camping and away from his phone and away from contact. 
And so when he got back to civilization, he had all these messages that Dana was murdered. So we went up to interview Sam, Dana's ex. And so when we confirmed that Dana was murdered, Sam was upset. He would respond to all of our questions, but he's just not the kind of person that elaborates. As we were talking to Sam, we noticed he did have some abrasions on his knees, and that's unusual. We asked him about that, and he said they were from playing baseball. It was baseball season. Detectives pressed Sam about his feelings toward Dana. When asked about his relationship with Dana, Sam described it as they were estranged, but they co-parented their kids, and they've had arguments, but overall, they were trying to make it work. Sam and Dana just grew apart. When she moved away, she was so excited. I think it made her feel good about knowing that she could be independent, and I think that was important for her to be able to do that on her own. We just felt that Sam was mad at Dana for having relocated three hours away and had split the family, and the hopes of having a family and a marriage were dashed and destroyed. Was that enough to push Sam over the edge and harm Dana? Based on the information that we had about her ending her time with her husband and becoming estranged, we thought Sam had possibly come over to discuss something that has to do with custody. And they'd gotten into a fight, and the fight resulted in Dana's death. Police ask Sam where he was the night of Dana's murder. Sam said that he had left his kids at his home, and he went and got gas. He showed us a receipt for that gas. He said the next day, he went camping with the triplets. Detectives believe Dana was killed sometime between midnight and 7 a.m. But Sam cannot corroborate where he was at that particular time. There wasn't an ironclad alibi. He didn't have three adults who would be able to say he was with us all night. They were kids. They were sleeping. It was not impossible for Sam to have left the kids and come back to Dana's house and committed the murder. And we looked at the possibility that he filled up his gas tank, drove to Puyallup, killed Dana, and then drove back to the kids at the home. Investigators pressed Sam further. Sam denied killing Dana. When we approached Sam for his fingerprints and his DNA, he was not necessarily agreeable or cooperative, didn't like the idea that he was a potential suspect. He certainly didn't like the idea that we thought that he might be responsible for her murder. Sam didn't really want to cooperate with requests for DNA and hair samples. Sam's behavior may be suspicious, but police have no concrete evidence to tie him to the murder. You can't charge someone with a crime just because their alibi isn't ironclad. You, you can't charge them with a crime because they can't prove they were someplace else. You have to prove that they committed that crime. There has to be evidence at the scene that connects the person to the crime. And so in this particular case, they didn't have that with Sam. While police seek hard evidence against Sam, Dana's autopsy results come in. The results were that she had died of strangulation. The cause of death was a fracture of the cracoid cartilage in her throat. There was a great deal of damage to her throat, her windpipe, and it would have taken somebody very, very strong to have done that kind of damage. We were going to be looking for an offender who had upper body strength and prone to flying into a rage. Because of the fracture of the cracoid cartilage, it takes a great deal of strength. And a strangulation itself takes a very committed attack. A victim generally fights back. And then the attacker has to double down on the strangulation while the victim is struggling back. Just to think that Dana struggled and fought for her life, it's just wrong. It's all wrong. Looking for new leads, detectives turn to Dana's niece. Police contacted Amanda as she was a relative and somebody who knew the victim. And what Amanda said was that Dana was the kind of person where she could go over, do laundry, maybe get a little bit of money. That was who she was, and, and that's how she helped out Amanda. And she didn't know what had happened or who would want to murder her aunt. 
Detectives also speak to the couple who employed Dana as a nanny. When asked if they knew of anyone who might want to harm Dana, their answer is chilling. Dana's employers told us that Dana was being stalked by this guy. Her employers told us that Dana had said that if anything happened to her, he'd be the one. And that was significant to us because I'm looking for a killer. Police investigating the strangling of Dana Laskowski have been told that she was being harassed by a stalker. Could he be her killer? Dana's employers told us that Dana was afraid of Miss Patrick. Patrick was a guy that installed cable in Dana's area. He liked her. Dana had told her sister-in-law and her employer he had kind of gotten fixated on her. Dana, by accounts, let him know that she wasn't interested. Police learned that Patrick had been trying to contact Dana for over a month straight and that his pursuit had become even more intense. Patrick was leaving notes and flowers on her back porch. He wrote some notes that were like poems. Then, the messages took a disturbing turn. Dana's friends told the investigators he left her a note letting her know that he had been observing her and seen her doing things inside her home that he wouldn't know unless he was observing her. Dana mentioned that she was concerned about someone possibly watching her. The thing that really concerned Dana was that it appeared that he had had her under surveillance. Dana had actually told a couple of people that if I ever turn up dead, Patrick did it. Investigators checked Dana's phone records, searching for any clues. The phone records indicated that Patrick had phoned Dana repeatedly. It wasn't just some guy who, you know, sent her a couple extra texts and then disappeared. This was somebody who was going beyond that, doing stalking type things that would be concerning in any context. When investigators look into Patrick further, they make an alarming discovery. Patrick was driving a white van. It was a ladder truck. We had neighbors that had identified a white van in the area around Dana's residence prior to the murder. His work van had been seen in the alley behind the house. It was a white van, so it matched the description that the neighbors had mentioned. Pretty much demanded that we look at him as a very real suspect in killing Dana. Did Patrick's obsession with Dana turn deadly? We immediately got a search warrant for his DNA, for his locker, for his vehicle. On September 2nd, detectives find Patrick at his home address. We served the search warrant on him. He was very belligerent and very uncooperative with us during the service of that search warrant. He didn't want to answer questions. He didn't want to let them in the house. He did the kind of things that you might expect somebody to do if they had, in fact, been stalking someone and had gotten caught doing that. Investigators bring Patrick down to the station where they tell him Dana has been murdered. His demeanor changed 180 degrees from being belligerent and confrontational to Dana is dead. He says, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. I didn't kill her. Here, please take my DNA. Search everything. I'm not the one who killed her. Detectives ask Patrick where he was the night Dana was murdered. Patrick said that he was at work that evening. He then hung out with some friends and went to bed. Once given the information for his alibi, investigators looked into it, and they were actually able to verify it. He had an alibi and could not have committed the murder. We also ruled out Patrick's ladder truck with the van the neighbors told us that they saw drive around Dana's residence. There was nothing in the service of the search warrant or in our investigation that indicated that Patrick wasn't being truthful with us. Given what he had done and the ways in which he had scared Dana prior to that, 
he's very lucky that his alibi could be confirmed. Having cleared Patrick, investigators now focus on another man in Dana's life, Michael, who they learned was having a long-distance relationship with her. Michael lived up in Canada, worked in the film industry. Dana met him when she was up in Canada visiting one of her friends. And they hit it off, and so they started to date. But he stayed in Vancouver, and she was down in Puyallup, and that's a several-hour drive from Puyallup to Canada. Friends tell police that their relationship was not without problems. They said Michael would party to the level of like a teenager, that he was at a certain level of partying that Dana didn't approve of. And so Dana was a little uncomfortable with that. There'd been a point where Dana had broken it off, but he was still interested, so they tried to make it work and get back together. But when detectives dig deeper, they learn Michael has a darker side. We were told that Michael was a biker, that he was a heavy drug user. Police also uncover a significant piece of information. Dana confessed to a friend that she'd had a one-night stand. And when Dana had that one-night stand, she was still in a relationship with Michael. Could this have been a motive for Michael to kill Dana? When we found out that Dana had a one-night stand, we looked at Michael as a potential suspect, possibly murdering Dana out of revenge. Investigators searching for the killer of single mother Dana Leskowski have a new possible suspect, her boyfriend Michael. Detectives want to know if an infidelity may have led to Dana's death. That caused us to believe that we had to rule him out as a person of interest. Michael lived in Canada, so we went up and when we talked to Michael about Dana's death, it appeared to us that he was very emotionally overcome by it, that Dana was the love of his life and that she had been taken out of his life and that he was very seriously grieved. Michael also tells police he knew about the one-night stand, but had moved on. Detectives press him further. Michael told us that when he was on the phone with Dana on the night of her death, that she seemed a little guarded to him. He told her that he loved her, and then she didn't tell him back that she loved him, and he thought that was a little odd. He didn't like how the conversation ended. And that prompted him to want to get on the road and come down to see her and see if everything was okay. Michael claims he never made it to see Dana. He said he was stopped at the border and he was turned away. He had some legal matter up in Canada that wasn't settled, and so he wasn't admitted. There was border crossing records that verified his alibi, that he did not cross the border. He got stopped by Border Patrol, and so he was able to show definitively that he was not anywhere near Puyallup at the time of Dana's murder. We didn't find the evidence to support that Michael had committed the murder. Michael is ruled out as a suspect. Police also determined the man Dana had a one-night stand with was nowhere near her house on the night of the murder. At this point of the investigation, we just were really kind of at a dead end. I mean, there were all these people who would have been really good, solid suspects in any homicide investigation, but all of them had alibis, and all the alibis were verified. I was frustrated that the case wasn't moving forward, that it wasn't advancing. With the case at a standstill, Detectives search for any detail they may have overlooked. Where Dana's ashes are inurned, there's a book. And people can go and write their memoirs. The book has been left open for comments since Dana's funeral. If the perpetrator was someone who went to the funeral, and if the perpetrator was someone who maybe had some guilt about that, they may have left a clue behind. When detectives look at the book... One entry, written over a month after the funeral, grabs their attention. One of the memoirs that was written was written by Dana's niece, Amanda. And she said, I'm so sorry I wasn't a better niece for you. 34 days clean and sober, it's all for you. That was significant. There was something about the way that she'd written it 
that suggested it was a communication to Dana of remorse and to make amends for what had happened. And it was something that was significant enough to follow up on. Why did Amanda write that she had let Dana down? Detectives have a hunch that she may know more about her aunt's death than she's been letting on. That's it. That's the key. The key is the niece. I called Amanda in for an interview. When I asked her, what do you know? She said, I wasn't there. I don't know what happened. With Dana gone, Amanda has been missing a mother figure, getting into trouble, and as detectives learn, spending time with a rough crowd. In the center of Puyallup downtown, we had Pioneer Park, and a lot of troubled teens would hang out there. The park kids called themselves the park rats. Amanda usually would be out around town in the middle of the night hanging out with the park rats. Dana would often welcome Amanda's circle of friends into her own home. Could one of the park rats that Amanda knows have been somehow involved in Dana's death? And I talked to her about who of her friends would meet this profile of having upper body strength, prone to flying into a rage. And Amanda said, well, it sounds like you're describing Blaine. She said Blaine actually attacked her on a couch, and it was a rather brutal attack. Blaine had come onto her, and that she had rejected him, and that he had become violent. Had Blaine tried the same thing on Dana, only for things to turn deadly? Blaine had been in Dana's house before in some casual get-togethers, and possibly Dana would have rebuffed that advance, and that Blaine would be the kind to fly into a rage. Then Amanda reveals something else. Amanda said that while we were processing her Auntie Dana's crime scene, she was across the street. She ran into Blaine there. She said that Blaine had scratches on his arms. When I get this information from Amanda, I look in to Blaine and I find that he's got a violent past and he has quite a criminal history. Police learn that Blaine's rap sheet is extensive and littered with drug and gun charges. I felt he was a very good person of interest in the murder of Dana Laskowski. But there's a big problem. Blaine is no longer in Washington. I found him living in the far southeast part of the United States. I wanted to bring him back to Washington to collect his DNA, to talk to him as a person of interest. But he was not cooperating. As investigators attempt to extradite Blaine, they seek out known criminals he's associated with and find one of them, a friend of Blaine's, serving time in jail. I sat down with him and I said, I'm looking at Blaine as being responsible for the murder of Amanda's aunt. He's got this upper body strength, he's prone to violence. And he looked at me and he said, Blaine didn't kill Amanda's aunt. What I was told completely changed everything. Detectives hunting the killer of Dana Laskowski have a new suspect, Blaine, the troubled friend of Dana's beloved niece, Amanda. With Blaine out of state, investigators grill his friend in jail, and what he tells them is explosive. So police suggested to him that maybe Blaine had been involved. The friend said, no, it's not Blaine, it's Emily. He said, Emily killed Amanda's aunt. It's a stunning allegation. 17-year-old Emily Lauenborg is Amanda's best friend and someone who Dana treated like a daughter. I felt what he was telling me was not possible because Dana always had an open door and was always welcoming to Emily. Police found out that a lot of times Amanda and Emily would show up at Dana's house. Dana was somebody that Emily could go to safely regardless of the circumstances, and Dana would take her in. So as you can imagine, that was quite a shock to the team. To confirm his story, investigators speak to other members of the Park Rats. Two of these kids told me, yes, Emily killed Amanda's aunt. Blaine didn't kill Amanda's aunt. 
One of these individuals told us that Emily was doing a lot of drugs. Had Emily's reckless behavior somehow played a role in Dana's death? I was told that they all had nicknames for each other and that Emily's nickname was Mutant. The first nickname that we call her was the Mutant because she was stronger than any of any other girls that we knew. Everybody's scared. Your ass knocked out. She was tough. She would challenge them to wrestling. She would beat them in wrestling. She was very intense. And I was told she's able to choke people. She would wrap one arm around their neck, grab the other hand, and flip their body over her hip. And that was consistent with the body position that we found Dana Laskowski in. Twisted at the waist, with one arm behind her back, and an injury to the neck. And so the initial thought that it can't be hurt was slowly replaced with, well, maybe it could be her. She's intense, she's strong, and everybody seems to be kind of scared of her. Did Emily actually kill Dana? And if she did, what could be her motive for committing such a heinous crime? Investigators bring Emily in for an interview. I sat down with her, and I had a tape recorder, and she said, aren't you going to turn that thing on? I would say she was quite self-confident, a little cocky. She was not particularly cooperative with efforts to talk to her about what happened. I said, you know, here you are, sitting in a police station under suspicion of murder, and you're playing this game with a detective. And I said, look at these people right here that have told us you killed her. And she said, those people are lying and that she didn't do it. She got very angry. Those people are lying. When investigators ask Emily where she was the night of the murder, she dodges the question. She was bartering and arguing with me and not really giving me a clear defense and denial. Officers obtain a warrant to search Emily's residence. One of the items that they recovered from Emily's apartment was a shirt that Emily had taken from Dana. One of her friends told us that Emily had a black shirt that belonged to Dana and that she actually wore that to Dana's funeral. We went back to the pictures of the funeral and did see that Emily was wearing a black shirt. One possible explanation for that was rubbing her nose in it. Not only did I kill you, but I'm wearing your blouse to your funeral. The search uncovers more incriminating evidence. And we found this journal. And in the journal, it said, 10 things I want to do before I die. And one of those 10 things was kill somebody and get away with it. One of the statements in the journal that Emily wrote in her own hand when talking about Amanda, because she'd gotten into an argument with Amanda, was, I could effing strangle that bitch just like her aunt. So that was very significant. I was invigorated because I had something. That's about as close to a confession as you're going to get. It is absolutely sufficient for me to take that to a jury and say, this is her admitting that she killed Dana Laskowski. On March 13th, 2003, Emily is charged with first-degree murder. When I found out that Emily did what she did, I couldn't believe it. When you find out that such a young person could take a life, how is that possible? Someone that Dana was trying to help and care for, that had to be a huge betrayal. You just can't fathom it. You can't comprehend it. It's devastating. Though Emily is in custody, prosecutors know most of the evidence against her is circumstantial. So they circle back to Amanda. It become pretty clear that Amanda was going to be the key to solving this. We needed Amanda to crack, because absent that, or a confession, there wouldn't have been enough to prove that Emily committed that crime. If Amanda did know what happened, 
Why hadn't she told police? And why had she covered for her best friend? So I meet with Amanda and I said, listen, Amanda, you have led us on a wild goose chase. Starting off with Blaine, who was in another state. He didn't do this. You have not come forward with this right from the start. You know what? This is a case of conspiracy after the fact. So tell me what happened. That's when she really cried and sobbed. Police have charged local teen Emily Lauenborg with the murder of Dana Laskowski. Now, investigators suspect Emily's best friend, Amanda, Dana's own niece, may also be involved. I said, all right, tell me what happened. You've sent us on every possible goose chase and every rabbit trail you could head us down. It was all a bunch of lies. Through tears, Amanda makes a horrific revelation. Amanda disclosed that she and Emily came to Dana's house and they came to the back door. They were high on some drugs and they just went up to try to get some money. And Emily was rude and Dana said, you girls have to go. Things quickly escalate. Emily was being belligerent and Dana touched Emily to kind of guide her out the door and Emily just exploded into a, a rage or attack. Basically she attacked her, put her in that wrestling hold and squeezed too tight with some kind of scarf or fabric. Amanda said she turned around because she didn't want to watch what was happening. But she heard a crack and she heard a gurgle. She heard Dana gasping for her life and then she didn't hear anything. And that was because Dana was dead. And then they took the money and left. It seemed to be, by Amanda's account, that it was kind of an explosive situation that got out of control. They didn't go to the house to murder Dana. I was told that Emily had said that Amanda was always ditching her for her aunt. Emily, she was jealous of Dana. It's my opinion that the motive Emily had was to get Dana's influence out of Amanda's life. And Emily just went over there with the intention of getting Dana so mad at Amanda that Amanda wouldn't be welcome at Dana's anymore. And that Emily would have achieved what she wanted. And that the murder simply got out of control because of emotions and drugs. But why didn't Amanda come forward earlier to tell the truth about what happened that night? I asked her, why didn't you tell us? Right up front, right at the start. She said, because of my family, it's so bad now. What's it going to be like now when they find out? She wasn't involved in the murder, but she was involved because she was there at that time. And I don't know why she didn't do anything. It was upsetting and surprising to all of us. Prosecutors need Amanda's testimony to have any hope of convicting Emily for murder. Amanda agrees and will not face any charges herself. If she's charged with a crime, then she has the right to remain silent. She was the star witness for the case. If we had charged her criminally, we couldn't have called her as a witness. Despite the agreement, prosecutors fear Amanda won't keep her side of the deal. The biggest challenge for us from a prosecution standpoint was that setting aside Amanda's testimony, everything else was circumstantial. Wearing a blouse can be explained away. An angry journal entry can also be explained away. I think the only way that we could have been successful in front of a jury was to have Amanda take the stand. The problem was knowing exactly where Amanda's loyalties would be. She was very conflicted. And there was definitely a chance that Amanda could have taken the stand and said, I lied to the police when I said what I saw. And I didn't see any of that. I was very concerned that the jury was going to listen to this case and look at Emily and say, I just don't buy it. 
This is a case where had we taken it to a jury, all of those questions that had come up in the investigation, all the initial leads, all of the doubts that it could really have been Emily, all the alternate explanations were certainly enough that it could have been that a jury had decided that we just didn't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Prosecutors face a difficult choice. Risk Emily walking free after a jury trial or guarantee at least some jail time with a plea deal. Ultimately, what we're trying to do here is to make sure that we hold the killer responsible. Emily was allowed to plead guilty to a lesser charge of manslaughter. On January 21st, 2004, over two years after Dana's murder, Emily is formally sentenced. Emily was charged as an adult. Her sentence was just under seven years. Even though Emily is sent to prison, her sentence brings a mix of emotions. I felt a sense of relief that someone was now being held accountable for Dana's death, but I did feel angry. I thought, well, at least it's something, you know. But it just was amazing that you could take the life of a young mother and only get like six years. It doesn't make sense. Dana's family was upset that the sentence was so light. They felt that the person responsible for taking the life of Dana should have been given a stiffer sentence. It was really tragic. And one of the things about the criminal justice system is it doesn't put things back the way they were. It just tries to hold people responsible so people can move forward. I cried every night. I think I must have cried for a year. I miss her a tremendous amount. And um, I will think about her forever. I don't think we ever will get over the loss of something so tragic. I can't really say her family ever had closure because to them, the loss was the loss of Dana. A gavel dropping doesn't undo that loss. I miss her a lot. I think Dana would want to be remembered as a loving mother, a loving friend, and a loving child. 